So, what is Seven Days of Science? Hmm? Genuine question. Starting off the news this week, NASA have released a series of stunning images of 19 different spiral galaxies, all taken with the James Webb Space Telescope. These images have all become part of the Physics at High Angular Resolution in Nearby Galaxies program, a massive collection of data that has now even more to add to its database. This program has been collecting data for over a decade and as such, has many images taken from other telescopes other than James Webb, such as Hubble. Interestingly, some of these particular spiral galaxies have been imaged before with Hubble, allowing us to take a side-by-side -side comparative look at the images of space taken by the James Webb telescope and those taken by Hubble. In these comparisons, we can see the contrast of dark and light, almost a complete inverse. This is because while Hubble works with the visible light that is absorbed by dust, the James Webb Space Telescope views the infrared light that this dust now emits. This allows us to get a more complete view of the galaxies surrounding us and fill in the missing puzzle pieces that Hubble was not able to see. Speaking to NASA, one astronomer called the images mind-blowing even for researchers who have studied these same galaxies for decades and another researcher said that they feel like their team lives in a constant state of being overwhelmed, in a positive way, by the amount of detail in these images. Awesome words from the people who will be gathering as much data and meaning from these images as possible then, and it's always nice to have more fantastic pictures from James Webb. In other news, the moon is shrinking. Now before you look outside and come back to comment that it looks exactly the same size as last night, it is by a relatively small amount, but a fascinating fact nonetheless. In a paper titled Tectonics and Seismicity of the Lunar South Polar Region, researchers publishing in the Planetary Science Journal have sought to understand the risks to future moon missions when it comes to the potentially volatile nature of the moon's surface. One particular area that they looked at stands as a candidate for a possible landing zone for the Artemis III moon landing, NASA's planned mission to bring humans back to the moon in 2026. The study concluded that this area is a potential source for future seismic activity. Another rather fun conclusion that the study came to is that the moon has actually shrunk just a little over 46 meters over the last few hundred years. This was due to a combination of the Moon's core cooling and tidal forces from the nearby planetary body, Earth of course. What particularly interested the researchers was how these forces shaping the Moon also shaped its faults and affected its seismic activity. These forces shrinking the Moon are also creating more tension on the surface. A fascinating study and one of many that will be particularly useful as humanity looks to set up a more permanent base on the lunar surface. And moving on now from the massive to the rather tiny, as a study published in the journal Reviews of Modern Physics has determined the strength and distribution of nuclear strong force in a proton. Now, this paper was actually published back in late December, but the accompanying press report from the Jefferson Lab, where the research was conducted, was released more recently, so we're covering it now. Our knowledge of the fundamental forces, of which strong force is one, that govern our universe has advanced dramatically over the last few decades. But there are of course still a number of crucial questions still to find answers to. This study brings us an important step closer though. The researchers used theories on how gravity works at the smallest level to reveal these new details. Now an individual quark can't simply be separated from a proton, but according to this research, if it was that simple, the nuclear strong force calculated to be involved in binding protons together would require four tons of force to pull them apart. At such a small scale, that is of course quite ridiculous, but hey, that's tiny science for you. Also in the recent news, it has been discovered that terrestrial hermit crabs are using various plastic items for shells and are better at reusing our plastic waste than we are. These cute little animals require both land and sea to live in. They are soft-bodied 
and need shells to protect themselves from predators. To do this, they use gastropod shells, such as whelk shells, which they change as they get bigger. They, lit they quite literally move house. However, it would seem that they are no longer just using gastropod shells for homes. Some have turned to owl rubbish for an alternative form of shelter. Scientists analysed images of hermit crabs posted on social media platforms and identified 386 individuals with artificial shells. These shells were either made from plastic or some other form of man-made material, such as the ends of light bulbs. Pictures revealed 386 individuals using artificial shells, encompassing 10 out of the 16 known species. The most common item used as an artificial shell were plastic cups, amounting to 85% of the total. As to why they are now using plastic is unknown. It could be that gastropod shells are becoming harder for the hermit crabs to find, or because the plastic shells are lighter. Another possible reason could be that it provides them with camouflage in an increasingly polluted environment. Further research is needed to establish how this phenomenon may impact their evolution. The best gastropod shells are fought over and the males with the highest individual fitness win them. If this is no longer the case, the use of man-made materials for shells which are easier to obtain could be interfering with the evolution of these delightful little creatures. First up in the paleontology news for this week, we say hello to a new species of oviraptorosaur dinosaur from the Hell Creek Formation of North America. The paper explains how oviraptorosaurs, specifically the group of these dinosaurs called Canignathidae have been known from this and similar North American formations for a long time, but that their remains are often quite incomplete. Before now, the only Cagnathinid to have been described from Hell Creek was the giant Anzu Willei, the so-called chicken from hell, and is remarkably complete from one of these dinosaurs. Now paleontologists have named a second, smaller species of Cagnathinid from Hell Creek, and named it Eon Eophron Infernalis, with the name intended to translate as Pharaoh's Dawn Chicken from Hell, since Neophron is the genus name for the Egyptian vulture, which are sometimes called the Pharaoh's Chicken. The material known for this dinosaur comprises a partial hind limb that shows many diagnostic features, and by looking at thin sections of the bone, the researchers were able to tell that it was almost fully grown at the time of its death meaning it had an adult body size much smaller than Anzu. In addition, they found it to be quite distinct from other fossil remains from Hell Creek that appear to come from other small unnamed cagnagnathids, suggesting that at least three species of these dinosaurs all coexisted in this ecosystem. A fantastic addition to the iconic Hell Creek fauna then. Up next in the recent news, a brilliant new study has come out that has investigated how non-bird dinosaurs may have used their feathers to flush out hidden prey using a robot dinosaur. The researchers hypothesized that the penaceous feathers present on the forelimbs and tails of some non-bird dinosaurs, such as Chordipteryx, may have been used in displays that stimulated the sensory neural escape pathways in prey, forcing them out of hiding and enabling the dinosaurs to pursue. This hunting strategy is seen in several modern bird groups and is known as flush pursuing. In order to test this hypothesis, the researchers then constructed a robotic model of Chordipteryx on wheels, naming it Robopteryx, and placed it near some grasshopper test subjects. They then stimulated the arm and tail movements involved in the flush displays and recorded the grasshopper's responses which can be seen in some absolutely brilliant recordings in the supplementary information of the paper. The grasshoppers were found to be flushed more frequently when proto-wings were present at the ends of the forelimbs on the Robopteryx, and even more when white stripes were present on the wings, simulating striking colour patterns. The flushing rate was also higher when the tail feathers were present and when the area of the plumage was large. The researchers also recorded the neurophysiological responses of the grasshopper's escape pathway when they were exposed to computer animations of flush displays by dinosaurs. The neurons they measured are known to be involved in jump escape reactions in grasshoppers, and the peaks in their firing were found to be larger when proto-wings were present. So the research concludes flush pursue foraging may have played an essential role in the evolution of pinaceous feathers in non-bird dinosaurs allowing these animals to more reliably flush out their prey. 
Also in the news this week, an incredible new paper has been published reporting on the oldest known evidence of multicellular eukaryotes. Eukarya, the domain of life to which we and all animals, plants, fungi and others belong, first unambiguously appear in the fossil record about 1.65 billion years ago as unicellular life forms. However, these oldest multicellular eukaryotes are dated to 1.63 billion years ago, suggesting that simple multicellularity arose very early on in the history of the group. They come from a formation in North China and consist of serial unbranched filaments made up of between 2 to over 20 cells that potentially contain spores within them. Based on their size and complexity, they are identified as eukaryotes and may have been photosynthetic. They have been assigned to the species Chingshinia magnifica, originally named in 1989, and the researchers find that modern green algae provide the best analogue for what these fossils represent. These fossils are still fairly simple compared to much later multicellular organisms, however, suggesting that simple multicellularity came about very early on after eukaryotes evolved, but then the diversification of complex multicellular lineages happened about a billion years later. An absolutely incredible discovery, helping to further clarify the evolution of multicellular organisms. And finally for the news this week, the oldest Homo sapiens footprints in North Africa have been reported. Found on a rocky beach surface in the northwestern coast of Morocco, this trackway consists of 85 human footprints that appear to represent at least five individuals of different ages. This is the first human trackway to be found in North Africa that dates to the late Pleistocene and is about 90,000 years old. Due to this age and the size of the footprints, they can be confidently attributed to Homo sapiens. Morocco is particularly important for hominin evolution as the oldest fossil remains of Homo sapiens have been found there, at a site much further south than the trackway, and this new discovery therefore gives us a glimpse at some ancient human behaviour. It seems that this group of people were moving landward and seaward across a bar trough sandy beach foreshore and supports an ecological relationship between ancient Homo sapiens populations and coastal environments. The paper also notes that future erosion of the site by rising sea levels and storm events, while causing the destruction of currently exposed footprints, may reveal more tracks in the future, and they intend to continue monitoring the site. Another very interesting discovery, providing some new data on the behaviours of ancient members of our own species. Well, that's it for this week's very long episode of 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you on Sunday for a very exciting video.